last day in the first lecture uh, that will be conducted by Professor Dr. Andreas Eckhart uh, from the University of Cologne, Germany. Uh, Professor Andreas has been with us since the beginning of this uh, winter school. Uh, I remember the time when we uh, initiated this idea and we continued together in the journey. And uh, he has been always with us uh, in the, in each, during each uh, winter school. And uh, today he is going to speak on the astrophysics, on selected topics and works in astrophysics. Uh, Professor Andreas, is, he will introduce himself, but uh, I will just give a short, you know, uh, casual. You mean it full screen? Uh, his, his, a uh, pure astrophysicist, uh, but when he discovered uh, works, uh, Muslim uh, works done in Islamic civilization on astrophysics, he went and he studied Arabic on, on his own and uh, learned Arabic and uh, did this uh, works, uh, studies and uh, Muslim contributions to astrophysics. He will uh, give further details on. Himself in the, uh, in the match. Uh, Professor Andres, there is yours. You can, uh, yeah, you can give this one for the audience. Yeah, I, I hope this, this the... is loud enough, I guess. Test one, two, three. Good. So I'm present. All right. Um, yeah, Shukran Jizilan. Hadi Fursa Jamila Jidan Li and Ulkri Mohadra or Mohadra Tain Bilot El Arabia. Yani Fibidea the Benamich and Mohadra Tain Saulkri Bilot El. Arabia or Baradetic Sawesel below till Inglesia. Um, Awalan Anatakit Uneka Batal as Illa, Mathalan, um, Mather Yanta Viruna, Unafi, Heather Bernamich or Kasir, uh, Waidan, um, Men Anna, Wa Limada Afal, Heddy Alashia, and a Kadim Alyom, Huna. Um, that doesn't work. Ah, Nam. كما قال أستاذ مسعود أنا ألماني من مدينة كولن وتستطيع أن تسأل أين مدينة كولن أو كولونيا هي في شرق وغرب ألمانيا المدينة ليس كبيرة جدا يعني عدد السكان حوالي مليون واحد وهذا الرقم ثابتا جيدا جدا um, و طبعا عندما تتحدث عن مدينة كولن يجب أن تتكلم عن الكاتدرال يعني هي هذه الكاتدرال مشهور جدا وهي كبير جدا أيضا بمقارنة مع كاتدرال أخرى التي تستطيع أن تجد في فرنسا مثلا هي ثلث ثلاثة مرات بالحجم يعني طولها حوالي مية و um, Saba wa Hamsin meter, um, wa um, Bunyat, um, uh, Munda, um, the Munda Tawida Jidan, Yani Badat fi Alf, um, um, uh, um, 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 Yani fi, fi Hawari fi, um, fi, um, 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 Munda al Mutawasid. وانتهى انتهى في 1880 يعني هي تقع هنا في وسط المدينة هذه خريطة من مدينة كولن وتستطيع أن ترى نهر أرين هي نهر كبير جدا والكاتدرال هنا في وسط المدينة ولكن لا توجد فقط لا يوجد فقط الكاتدرال عندنا أيضا كثير من المساجد في كولن مثلا هذه المسجد الجديدة المسجد الجديد هي مسجد أحد كبير المسجد في ألمانيا يعني تاريخ الافتتاح كانت في ألفين وثمانية عشر وهي كبير جدا يعني 
ارتفاع يبلغ ارتفاع المؤذنة حوالي 55 متر وقطر القبة 25 متر وهي تقع المسجد تقع هناك في هذا المكان أيضا في وسط المدينة حوالي وطبعا توجد أيضا الجامعة هناك جسم من الجامعة يعني هذه هذا قسم الفيزياء والمعهد أنا أعمل فيه في هذا المبنى اسمه يعني أو المعهد الفيزياء يعني توجد معهد أخرى أيضا هناك نعم والجامعة هنا في في هذا المكان في وسط المدينة يعني كل شيء قريبة جدا وتستطيع أن تتب على الأقدام بسهولة وكل شيء في وسط المدينة طبعا تستطيع أن تسأل ما هذه المواضيع التي نحن نعمل عليها في في هذا المعهد ونحن نهتم بالفيزياء الفلك أو الفيزياء الفلكية يعني نحن نعمل في 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 فيزياء حقيقة ولكن كل المواضيع نحن نعمل عليها من علم الفلك وخصوصا مثلا الصبغ الجذيئية وتكون النجوم أو موضوع آخر مركز دربة تبانا ومراكز المجرات الأخرى وأيضا نحن نعمل بشيء آخر يعني تطوير وبناء أجهزة القياس للتلسكوبيات الكبيرة وهذا في لموجود الراديو أو لموجود الأشعة تحت الحمراء وهذه الأجهزة للمراصد الكبيرة مثلا المرصد الأوروبية الجنوبي في تشيلي في جنوب أمريكا وأيضا فينا شيئا لل جيمس ويب تلسكوب التي تتبع هابل تلسكوب وكل شيء يعمل جيدا جدا مثلا هذا الجهاز نحن فينا للمرصد الأوروبية في جنوب أمريكا في بلد تشيلي يعني هناك تستطيع أن ترى بعض التلسكوبيات الكبيرة وقطر المرآة في هذه التلسكوبيات حوالي ثمانية فاصلة اثنين متر يعني مرآة كبير جدا وتستطيع أن تربط الضوء من كل هذه التلسكوبيات يعني هناك القناة التي تستطيع أن تستخدمها لذلك وكل الضوء تذهب إلى مكان واحد وفي هذا المكان تستطيع أن تجد أجهزة التي بنيت في معهد كولون طبعا نحن نعمل سويا مع فرقة من الأولماء من أوروبا وهناك قناة وتستطيع أن تربط الضوء من التلسكوبيات المختلفة وهناك تستطيع أن ترى داخل كما تستطيع أن ترى داخل في من هذه القناة يعني كل شيء كبير جدا وهناك الجهاز الصغير التي فعنا لهبل سبيس تلسكوب وهذا الآن خارج في الـ في الـ للعمل في الفداء وكل شيء يعمل جيدا جدا وطبعا أنا شخصيا كما قال أستاذ مسود أنا شخصيا بعد زيارة جامعة شارقة 
اهتم بالنصوص العربية القديمة عن دار قطبانة لأن ذهبت إلى هناك ولقيت مخادرة عن دار قطبانة وظنت ممكن هذه فرصة جميلة أن ألقي مقدمة باللغة العربية عن النتائج من العرب القدماء وبحثت عن ذلك ووجدت بعض النصوص حول دار قطبانة وبدأت أن أعمل عليها وقدمت أيضا بعض المقال مقاعد عن هذا الموضوع يعني نحن نرى عن النتائج من من هذا العمل بعد ذلك نعم يعني نحن نختم عن معروفة دار بدبانة في المناطق الثقافية العربية وهذا البرنامج في في بداية البرنامج سأتحدث عن دار بدبانة وجميع المجرات الأخرى في كون وهذا مخلص للمعروفات الجديد الخيالي الخيالية وبعد ذلك سأواصل باللغة الإنجليزية وسنتحدث عن باب أزويلا يعني يوجد شعر جميل جدا وفي هذا الشعر تستطيع أن تجد معلومات حول باب أزويلا وهذا يتعلق أيضا عن بعض المعلومات بنسبة العين مع الفلك وأيضا بنسبة المجرة وسوف نرى بالتأكيد ماذا يعني ذلك وبعد ذلك في نهاية نستطيع أن نذهب إلى بعض النصوص والمخطوطات العربية قديمة ونستطيع أن نرى ماذا قال ماذا قالوا بعض العلماء عن دار بدبانة مثلا المزوقي ابن رخيق وابن ماجد وأيضا ابن ابن الحيثم نعم وكل شيء في هذه المخادرة ونستطيع أن نذهب إلى المخادرة الثانية نعم نعم الآن معلومات عن دار بدبانة نعم تستطيع أن تسأل لماذا يجب علينا أن نعرف ذلك عندما نتحدث عن النصوص القديمة ولكن هناك دليل من بعض المؤلفين من هذه النصوص وهناك بعض الأسئلة ولا تستطيع أن تتحدث عن نتائج من هذه المؤلفين عندما لا يعرف شيئاً عن المجرة وعن المجرات الأخرى يعني عن معروفات الجديدة مثلا يوجد توجد الأسئلة يوجد السؤال لماذا تكون دار بتبانة أكثر إشراقا في سيف منها في شتاء وتستطيع أن تجد الإجابة فقط عندما ما هذا الحيكل من المجرة أو نحن أنفسنا نعيش في دار بدبانة طبعا يعني الأرض والشمس والشمس جزء من دار بدبانة ولكن إذا ماذا يعني هذا التعبير المسافة بين كرة الأرض ودار بدبانة لماذا تستطيع أن تصل أن تتحدث عن هذا هذا السؤال عندما نحن نفسيا جزء من من دار بدبانة أو سؤال آخر من أكشف أول مجرة خارج دار بدبانة لأن دار بدبانة مجرة مثل كثير من المجرات في الكون والأسئلة ماذا من اكتشف أول مجرات خارج دار بدبانة أو في نهاية ما هو وضع البحث بنسبة المجرة مجرة دار بدبانة في عام ألف عشرين وألف تسعمائة وعشرين تستطيع أن 
تفكر لا يوجد ربط بين هذه هذا التاريخين يعني الفرق 100 سنه ولكن كما نستطيع نرى نستطيع ان تفعل مقارنه بين خيلة البحث بالنسبه لدربه دبينا هناك وكل شيء بدا الى حد ما هنا في البلاد العربيه ومع ابن الهيثم كان ابن الهيثم اول من قدم مبكررا جيدا بان المسافه بين كره الارض ودربه تبانا اكبر بكثير من مسافه الى القمر لان ارسطو قال دربه تبانا هي جزءا من الحواء يعني قريبا جدا مثل السخط ولكن هذا ليس صحيح و ابن الهيثم وجد الاجابه السالمه لهذا المشكله وسبب هذه النتيجه هو المقارنه ببيانات التي قدمها بتوليميوس ووجد ابن الهيثم لم يغير موقع النجوم مقارنة مقارنة عن خافة المجرة منذ 800 عاما. يعني هذا هو هو في المقارنة بين المسافة من النجوم إلى خافة المجرة ورأى بوضوح أن هذه المسافات نفس نفس المسافات ولهذا السبب هو قال المجرة يجب عليها أن أن يكون بعيدا جدا من الأرض وسوف نرى بالتأكيد ماذا يعني ذلك ولفهم قيامة النتيجة نحتاج إلى فهم ما هو دربة بينا وما هو الدور الذي يلعبه في الكون وقبل أن نستطيع أن نتحدث عن ذلك يجب أن نتحدث عن بعض المقياس المسافة مثلا يوجد أشياء مثل دو مثل سنة الدوية أو بارسيك وهكذا وهذه دليل من المسلخات المهمة يعني light year one light year يعني دو السنة الدوئية هي المسافة التي تقطعها الدو في سنة واحدة يعني بعيدا جدا يعني حوالي تسعة تسعة درب عشرة وس حداشر كيلومتر ويوجد أيضا شيء آخر يعني بارسك واحد وبارسك واحد حوالي ثلاثة سنوات دوئية وبارسك هو المسافة التي ترى فيها الزوايا بين الشمس والأرض كزوايا ثانية واحدة يعني هي واحد على ثلاثة ألف ستمية درجة وطبعا بعد ذلك يوجد كيلو بارسك وميجا بارسك وجيجا بارسك وهذا شيء مثل ذلك يعني ميجا بارسك ألف في ألف بارسك وهكذا ثم بعض الأمثلة على المسافات مثلا عندما نتحدث عن دو دو سنة دوئية النجم أقرب من شمس سنة هو بروكسيما سنتاوري أو قنطور الأقرب والمسافة إلى هذا النجم أربع حوالي أربع سنة دوئية وثم بارسك يعني المسافة النموذجية للنجوم المسؤولة عن الدو التي مثل اللبن في المجرة 
هذه المسافة حوالي كيلو بارسيك أو كيلو بارسيك اثنين كيلو بارسيك والمسافة إلى وسط المجرة هناك ثمانية كيلو بارسيك يعني في هذا الطريق تستطيع أن تستخدم كيلو بارسيك وثم عندما نصل إلى المجرات الأخرى خارج دار بادبانا المسافة إلى المجرة التي أقرب منا 800 كيلو بارسيك وهذه وهذا منظر دار بادبانا من العلا يعني مركز دار بادبانا هناك والشمس هناك والمسافة بين بينهما 8 كيلو بارسيك حوالي ونستطيع أيضا هذا كوس كوس المجرة ويوجد أيضا ذلة هناك يعني في الحقيقة مجراتنا هي مجرة خلد سنية دلعية يعني spiral galaxy بعد spiral galaxy وهذه هذه المجرة من من الجانب يعني هناك كوس المجرة الرقيق يعني رقيقا جدا ومرة ثانية هناك الشمس وهناك مركز المجرة وعندما هنا في وسط المجرة تستطيع أن ترى المجرة مثل ذلك يعني هناك وسط المجرة وهذا منظر القوس من الأرض ومن هو الذي وجد للمرة الأولى مجرات خارج الدربة دبانة وهو كان الصوفي وهو في الكتاب وفي هذا الكتاب هو تحدث عن هذا الصخب يعني هذه الصخب أندروميدا نسديم أندروميدا وهو وجد ذلك في المرة الأولى وهو قال هناك يوجد سخب أمام فم أمام فم السمك وأيضا هو تحدث عن السخابة السخابة مجلان الكبيرة الكبرى طبعا وقت إذن الاسم هذا السخب السخابة ليس كانت مثل ذلك لأن الاسم اليوم بسبب فادي ماجلان وهو وجد أو يعني بعض بعض الأشخاص التي كانت تحت خدمته وجد هذه السخب في سنة ألف خمسمية وخمسة وعشرين أو خمسة عشر ولكن في الحقيقة هو خمس مئة من قبل من ذلك هو وجد هذا هذه السخابة الكبرى وطبعا لم لم عرف لم يعرف ما ما هذه ال 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 السخابة سخابات وطبعا هنا زيمون ماريوس وهو اكتشف للمرأة الثانية أندروميدا أيضا ستمية بعد أن الصوفي تحدث عن ذلك ثم يجب أن نثب من الصور إلى الفيزياء وهناك مهم جدا شخصين ومهم جدا أيضا مارغريت بوغنز وهي فيها تحليل التايفي للنجوم وتحليل التايفي للنجوم هو الانتقال من علم الفلك إلى الفيزياء الفلكية يعني تستطيع أن تتبع عن فيزياء الفلك الأفلاك ماذا يحدث في هذه النجوم وأيضا هذه طريقة جميلة جدا أن تجد المسافة إلى النجوم وأيضا المسافات إلى المجرات الأخرى ثم مهم جدا 
الفهم بنسبة طرف تبانا وحدث هذا الجدول العظيم بين هيلو شابلي وهيبر كورتيس وهيلو شابلي قال جميع السدم الخلصونية يعني مثل ذلك جميع جميع الصدم الخلصونية هي جزء من درب دبانا يعني جزء من درب دبانا ولكن كورتيس قال درب دبانا هي فقط جزيرة واحدة جزيرة كون يعني جزيرة واحدة من جزر من كثير من الجزر في كون وهي بشكل مجرة خلصونية توجد كثير من من هذه المجرات وهذا حدث الجدول العظيم يعني السؤال كان هل المجرات جزر, جزر نجمية أو لا وشابلي قال أنا لا حق وكورتيس قال أنا لا أنا لا حق وهكذا ويوجد بعض المقالات ممتع جدا حول هذا هذه المشكلة ثم إدوين هابل وجد حل هذه المشكلة وهو في الكشف عن المجرات ووجد أنها خارج طرف الدبانة يعني بعيدا جدا وهذا حدث أيضا بمساعدة التصوير مثلا بنسبة التصوير الناس في المقارنة بين صور من مجرات بين تاريخين يعني هناك هذه المجرة هناك صور من 1901 ونسى مجرة في صورة أخرى في سنة 1914 وتستطيع أن ترى أن يوجد بعض النجوم هذا النجم هناك ولا تستطيع أن تستمخ أن تستمخ هناك ولكن هناك نجم جيد جديد وهناك لا تستطيع أن ترى نجم وهذا شيء نحن نعرف من المجرة من من مجرتنا واسم من ذلك المستريات العظيمة يعني سوبر نوفا يعني بعض المرات نجوم التي عليها كثير من الوزن يفعل انفجار ولهذا سبب توجد كثير من الضوء من هذه النجوم وتستطيع أن تراها كنجوم جديدة وفي هذا الطريق تستطيع أن تقول أن هذه المجرات بعيدة جدا وتستطيع أن تقول أيضا شيئا عن المسافة واليوم حبل في على الصور جميل جدا ومثل مثل ذلك يعني حبل ديب فيلد وكل كل الأشياء في هذه الصور ليس نجوم ولكن مجرات يعني يعني أيضا هذه النقط الصغيرة جدا هذه مجرات بعيدة جدا وفي الوقت الخالي التلسكوب الجديد جيمس ويب يفعل نفس الشيء يعني صور عميق جدا في ضوء الأحمر حتى نستطيع أن نرى إلى بط أكبر من البط في هذه الصورة وهذا سور حبل مرة ثانية وفي أيضا نظام من أشكال المجرات ويوجد ثلاثة أنواع من المجرات الخلص النية وبعض منها عن عنها أيضا ذل ذلة ويوجد أشياء أخرى يعني مجموعة مجموعة المج المحلية يعني بعض المجرات سويا ونحن نعيش في في هذا الشيء يعني الدرب تبانا درب دبانا وأندروميدا يعني المرأة السلسلة 
وايضا السحب المجلان وايضا بعض المجالات الصغيره اخرى في في هذه الجروب وحجم من ذلك حوالي ميجا بارسك واحد يعني 770 وفي نهاية نستطيع أن نرى على الكون في كينيا وفي كثير من المجرات وحيكل الكون مثل تشبه رغوة مثل ذلك يعني يوجد أماكن وفيه لا يوجد لا توجد مجرات وفي بعض الأماكن يوجد كثير من المجرات يعني كل شيء في الكون بالنسبة لأماكن المجرات مثل الرغوة وفي نهاية نستطيع أن نرى نستطيع أن نرى آه. أن الكون بالكامل يعني هناك أيضا تاريخ الكون يعني كل شيء بدأ مع الانفجار الكبير في بداية وبعد ذلك شيء اسمه العصور المظلمة يعني هناك لا يوجد لا توجد نجوم ولا ولا توجد مجرات يعني كل شيء مظلم وبعد ذلك تكوين النجوم والمجرات ونحن اليوم هناك ونستطيع أن نستطيع أن نرى على حيكل الكون بالنسبة للرغبة من المجرات يعني بدأت هذه الرحلة العلمية مع ابن هيثم ووجد أن دربة بينا هي جزء من عالم النجوم بدلا من كونها جزء من الجو كما قال أرسطو نعم وهذا نهاية هذا جزء ونحن نستطيع أن نتحدث عن النصوص القديمة العربية عن المجرة خصوصا عن المجرة في نهاية نستطيع أن نرى نحن نستطيع أن نفعل رخلة من مكاننا يعني من العرض أو من الشمس اتجاه اتجاه وسط المجرة Can can you press this? I hope it starts. No, it will not. It's not on the stick. Well, the bus. Okay. Then we can go to the next. So, an OSL del Dorat in Inglesia. Alain. And we'll talk about Babs Vela. Um, and this is a very nice little project. Um, there's a, as I said, there is a um, small poem um, on Beb Azuela, and an appraisal of Beb, Az Beb Azuela. Um, and I found it about five years ago, and I knew immediately uh, what I would be able to do um, to do with it. But uh, it's only um, a few weeks before I came to Sharjah uh, this time that I uh, found the time to actually uh, sit down and do it. And uh, the result is um, expected, but nevertheless, uh, it is a little surprise. It's a, it's a very nice, tiny piece of work. So Beb, Beb Zuela is um, one of the three remaining city gates in uh, Cairo. And uh, it's a very nice one here in the middle. And uh, we'll see how it goes. So we will find that um, there is a Poet, Bilism Muhammad Anili, or Ali Muhammad Anili, and he wrote this poem as an appraisal of Beb Zuela. And this um, poem is a very, very nice mixture between poetry, architecture, history of the city of Cairo, astronomy, including the Milky Way, and Quranic tradition. So it's all within uh, four lines, basically. It's very nice. And the first record, or one of the first records of this poem, we have um, from Adahiri. Uh, Adahir, Abdul Adahir, 
uh, well, uh, and he wrote this book um, on the uh, monuments um, of uh, Cairo. And uh, as you can see, he lived uh, around uh, 1200, 1300. And uh, his book is one of the important heritage books on uh, geography as it deals with the description of most of the landmarks in Cairo and amongst them also Bebzuela. So this is how the text looks like. We will go through the um, um, translation and I'll just uh, indicate what the text lines are. So here it starts concerning Bebzuela. So first it says that they're all made out of bricks. And then there are details on Bebalzuela. There is uh, names given and also times given. And then it continues uh, with a poem, like here. Yeser, and then uh, the poem comes. We look at the poem in detail. Uh, and then it continues for a few lines until the very end. And then uh, he talks about other Bebs. And that is then what we find about Bebzuela. And there are some comments here by the editor of this book. So first of all, um, uh, there's some strange words in here. For instance, um, we get to this later. Um, Kaiwan, uh, this is basically Zohal. So this is a, a Persian word uh, for Saturn. And also a very strange word. Uh, you don't find it in text in, 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 uh, in word books. Uh, Bashura. Bashura. Um, and uh, if you start digging uh, what Bashura means, you find that Makrizi also commented on this poem and also found this word um, strange enough to make a comment on it. And um, he said um, that um, this Bebzuela is not um, linked, it is not connected with the Bashura. And he sees um, that the Bashura is a um, piece of um, fortification. So gates uh, are fortified by it. And it is a curved path within, within the gate. So this is... Uh, to um, stop down soldiers and horses so that they can't go through the gates uh, very quickly. And interestingly enough, um, after the one, one, one final sentence of appraisal, um, the, the author actually mentions that uh, the Mohandisun uh, are not happy with the gate because he doesn't have a bashura. And there's another source that describes what the bashura is. And uh, this uh, author also comes to the uh, um, result that it's a fortification outpost or a fortified gateway, so curved gateway within the gate. And one also finds sometimes, so it's a Mamluk um, fortification statement, and also finds sometimes that the Bashura is um, a, sand, a sandy dam. Um, and, um, uh, and also the problem is if you look for Ab Bashura, uh, it's a problem that the suburb of Beirut has exactly that name. So that uh, isn't, isn't helpful here as well. So it's a curved gateway entrance like this. So here's the uh, beginning of the gate and then you enter and then you have to go sort of in curves. You're not able to get straight through. And in fact, um, if you wanna look at such, such a gateway and if you have not ho no holiday plans until now, you can go to, um, to Spain, to Alhambra. And one of the main gates in Alhambra, the gate, gate of Esplanade uh, has such a, such a bashura in it. So if you enter the gate, you have to go first up and in a curve as well. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture from the inside. Now the translation of this poem goes as follows. So there are these, um, at first it says that all these gates uh, are made out of mud bricks. And then it names the three gates uh, that are of importance. And it uh, tells, um, that uh, a certain uh, person, Al Afdal Amir Al um, Juyush bin Amir Al Juyush, who, uh, um, uh, that he put his uh, name uh, onto the gate in 180. And uh, then there comes a um, um, statement that is basically been, been said uh, that is uh, then saying from, from whom these statements come. Um, and uh, this is the poem itself. So my friend, if you saw Bebzuela, you will appreciate its worth as a building, a gate that enveloped itself with the galaxy, wore Sirius and wrapped Saturn around his head. Had the Pharaoh seen it, he would not have wanted an edifice, nor would he have ordered a man to build him one. And uh, that's actually very strange. So there's lots of um, 
statements in here. And at first reading, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But then finally, if you look at it in detail, and if you go through the, trans to the translation uh, of some of the words, so this wrapping around, uh, there's examples of, of how to use the word in that context. Um, and also there is a statement, birasi. Uh, this birasi means uh, also straight overhead. So not bijiwar uh, or bijanib, but really straight overhead. And um, yeah, there's a few more words that have to be taken into account here. But in general, um, there's a name now mentioned, uh, this um, Amir uh, Jayush bin uh, Amir Jayush, and we can uh, look up what this person is. And, uh, and the, the date mentioned with it uh, is about 1102. And uh, you find out that this person, this uh, uh, after Lamir um, uh, bin Jayush, that he was a minister of uh, this person here, and uh, the, for that person, you find a date. So that date matches very well with the date above here that uh, that the author of the poem that the author gives. So that is that is something uh, reconfining. And um, then there's of course a, on the other hand a comment to this number to this date by the um, editor of the book. He says that this date is an illusion, an illusion from uh, Azahir. Um, and uh, he points out that the gates, uh, that this gates well has probably been built between 1087 and 1029, and um, that, uh, that therefore this, this date is, is fictive. But on the other hand, the, even if this may be the building dates, uh, all that um, was said is that uh, this uh, person um, put his name on the gate, so that might be uh, distinct from, from building it. In any case, uh, uh, Abdul Zahir is talking here about the second Beb Suela. We will see that there are two versions of the Beb, and that may be of interest. So then the Pharaoh uh, and Haman. Um, so Haman is a character mentioned in the Quran. And um, by the way, I think we don't have the actual, we don't have the actual version of this uh, zero zero. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. It's the one that we downplayed, the right one? Yes. Okay, well, we continue. We see what, what happens. Um, so in any case, um, there is uh, the Surah Al-Qasas. -Qas, Al and in there, it is said uh, that the Pharaoh asked um, Haman to build himself a building of baked clay bricks. And so we told him, uh, fire up the oven and uh, go to work. And this is also mentioned in the, in the Injil. Um, and uh, apparently, um, uh, the pharaoh let uh, people build um, large buildings here. Not necessarily the pyramids. The pyramids are not mentioned, but it's other building projects. Then there's a linkage between the Beba Zuela and the terrestrial phenomena. So in short, as we will see, Babe Zoela in general opens to the south. So you see all stars in the south sort of culminating over it. And uh, Sirius is, of course, an important star. And if it culminates, it's right in the meridian. And at, at times, Saturn, who also culminates in that region, will, will culminate exactly above Sirius. That is Birasi. So that's right on top. And if that would take, take place, uh, simultaneous culmination of Sirius and Saturn, then that would, of course, be most spectacular and could have given Mohammed Anili uh, an impetus to write the poem. And we can find out whether that, that actually was the case. So history of Beb Zuela. Um, Beb Zuela is one of the remaining three city gates, as I mentioned, and it's a major landmark in Cairo. It's look, looking like, like this. And... Um, its name uh, is due to the fact um, that um, Zuela is, um, or is a, a city in the region Fezan. And um, as you can see here, this, this is uh, Zawila, and this is the region Fezan. And the Fatimids recruited soldiers from that area at their time. And that's why the Beb uh, is, that was built by them is called Beb Zuela. Um, and also the Beb um, 
was an important um, exit to the south and uh, a traveling and a merchandise route uh, to northern Africa and to the south in general. Uh, other dates are important here, but first, uh, the, the detailed history of uh, Babes Vela is very complex. Uh, originally, the BAB has two gates, um, uh, but uh, one, the left gate was then closed because the citizens had some, some uh, superstition, some, some, they were afraid of something, so they didn't want to have it two gates, and one, one was then closed. And also, there was a prison very close, and um, in front of Babes Vela, uh, executions took place. So this gate has some strange character. And since it's also an exit gate, it was observed very thoroughly. So also the stars around it were observed very thoroughly. And uh, so that, that, that places it in sort of an interesting position. Then between 1087 and 1092, um, Badr al-Jamali built a second city wall. And uh, this time out of stone completely, not of mud bricks. And uh, he reconstructed uh, the three Babs, and Babs Vela was amongst them. So there are two versions of the Bab, as you will see. And then in the 15th century, uh, a Mamluk Sultan um, uh, made, uh, made it part of a mosque. And um, then later, somewhat later, um, as it was finalized, um, Babs Vela got up to two minarets. So these were not there in place from the beginning on. So location and orientation of the bed, because this is important for astronomical purposes. So these are um, sketches um, of, the, of, the, of the region, of the city. And this is the, the old wall with the first Babesweiler. And this is the, the new wall with the second Babesweiler. And you can see there is a small difference. Uh, the first Babesweiler is almost exactly oriented north-south. So if you look towards the exit, um, you look straight towards south, and you can look towards the meridian then, in a way. And the second one is on a curved street, it's tilted street. And even worse, um, the BEP as such is also tilted against the street. So in general, there is an offset from the southern direction of about 25 to 30 degrees or so. So then the statement, the gates that enveloped itself with the galaxy or Sirius and wrapped around Saturn as already said. So first let's talk about this one. And actually meant is that Sirius A, that is Canis Maiodis, um, yeah, the, this is the important star. And it has a right ascension of six hours, 45 minutes. And um, that tells you immediately that it's a winter constellation, a winter star. Um, and uh, also, it is of importance because it's part of the so-called winter triangle. So this is Sirius, Betelgeuse, and Procyon in the small um, um, Canis Minoris. And these three form a triangle, which is very obvious in the sky. Actually, you can observe it right now because uh, we have winter, and you, have, you know where Orion is, and then next to it, you find the winter triangle. And so that means if Sirius is culminating over the Babes Vela, at the same time, also the Milky Way is culminating over it, because Sirius is basically embedded in the, in the Milky Way. So those two things um, make sense now, and they agree. Then we heard about the retrograde motion of planets already. And in fact, uh, if, if you now look at this sentence here and wrap Saturn around its head, this wrapping around um, is basically the same thing that you see if the retrograde motion of a planet takes place. So it goes first forth and then back. And here's the retrograde motion explained once again. If you look straight away towards the planet and towards the meridian at night, then you look towards the central, central region of the retrograde motion. So the first planet that comes and then goes back and then it comes again. And for Saturn, that takes about 140 days, so four and a half months. And the overall throw here in, in angle is about eight to nine degrees. And also of importance, the orbital period of Saturn is 29.4571 years. So um, after 29.4571 years, you expect the source to be at exactly the same place once it culminated together with Sirius over the bed. 
And then we can look at this word here at nth, so this wa, and uh, one may consider it as an inclusive logical nth, so that both happens at the same time, namely that Sirius and the galaxy culminate over the gate, and at the same time, Saturn is on its retrograde motion. And one can check out um, when this happens. You can do that by vis visualization um, programs, looking at the sky at various times. You can also go to the ephemeris. Uh, that is a table of orbital periods uh, of uh, planets. Um, and uh, here you find then, for instance, the retrograde motion. If you, if you could read this, you could look at this, and you would see that the right ascensions are increasing. And from here on, from here on they are decreasing as well. And then they start increasing again, right? And this is basically the middle of the um, retrograde motion section. And if you would look closely, you would see that, that this central region here is um, at, at seven hours something. Uh, this is because it's not exactly the year. So this is the year uh, 2005, January 2005, whereas um, uh, a, a co-stating with Sirius occurs in February 2004, so one year earlier. And then, and then that right, right ascension is six hours and 40 minutes, very close to the right ascension series. That is how it would look like if we talk about uh, the first web that is opening to its south. Uh, here you see the Milky Way, you see Sirius, and you see Saturn uh, right on top of it. And that is your reference epoch in 2004, February 2004, that happened like this as well. And this is how it looks like if you take the data from the ephem ephemeris. This is the, uh, the wrapping of Saturn. And if you make a larger field of view, if you have Sirius here and then Saturn up here, you see at that instance, Sirius, uh, Saturn is, is culminating over Sirius, over the Babes Vela, and doing his thing here. Now, if you take into account the offset of 25 to 30 degrees of the second bed, uh, then the situation is a little bit more complicated. So you cannot take the culmination in the meridian, but uh, you have to see when Sirius is just setting over the central region of the bed. And then you cannot take um, the uh, equivalent uh, position of, of Saturn at the right, same right ascension, but um, Saturn has to be a little bit later then so that uh, they both uh, if you rotate the coordinate system, come to lie on top of each other. So that would be the second reference epoch. Um, and uh, here you see Saturn uh, doing the retrograde motion. And if you look at the sky, it would look like this. If you look at the right ascension declination, so Sirius is here, Saturn is following. But if you rotate it in local to local coordinates, as you would do it if you look at the web, you would have again Sirius and on top of it doing Saturn doing its thing. So also for the second web, you can have uh, combined culminations, uh, but offset a little bit in time. And this is now the, the, the picture you have um, of, the, of the poem. You have the web, second web here, off-centered, not exactly uh, opening towards the south. You have the Milky Way engulfing the web with Sirius on top of it. And at the same time, you have Saturn going through its retrograde motion. So this is what the poem basically describes. So now it makes all sense. So the question is now, who was Ma, um, uh, Ali bin Mohammed Anili? And when did he live? Because that is also not clear. Um, and um, yeah, we can actually calculate when these events happened. And rather than using the full ephemeris over more than a thousand years, which is difficult to get at. Uh, usually you find them only tabulated for a few hundred years back and forth. And you would have to throw away anyhow 97% of the ephemeris because uh, you're only interested in those um, that um, restate the reference epochs when uh, Saturn is culminating over uh, Sirius uh, exactly. We can use a more elegant approach. We know the, uh, the period. And we can calculate when uh, Saturn is relocated the same position. So we take the time of the reference epoch times n times the period and subtract it from it and then get the time when that would happen. And um, all we have to do then is um, take, um, take uh, now this abstract, this absolute is not necessary here, 
take, um, take the integer part of that time, that is the, the rest, and check that um, whether it is close to zero or not. Because if it is close to zero, that means that um, then um, Saturn is exactly over um, uh, Sirius. And um, I put in a little delta T that is uh, an, an allowance uh, about a third. I take about a third of the um, retrograde motion uh, for the exactness to be at the center of the retrograde motion. And then uh, if one is um, elegant, one usually stumbles and falls. So you have to uh, check the uncertainties of these calculations uh, with respect to the 4.5 months uh, Saturn spends in this retrograde motion. And sources of uncertainties could be uh, for serious the proper motion, but that is really very, very small. It's only uh, 20 minutes uh, in 1,000 years. So you can forget about it. It's very small. And um, then also um, the orbital period. If you think that the uncertainty year is the, is in the, is the last digit, now that would correspond to only plus or minus 0.8 hours. So that is uh, uh, one day, uh, 1.2 days in 1,000 years. So that's also not important. Another source of interest could be the precision and mutation. That is the change um, in the um, in, in this additional term on the precision. Uh, but that is also not of real importance because all the coordinates, uh, th th that is due to the fact that the spin axis of the Earth uh, rotates. And therefore, all coordinates, right ascension declination coordinates, change as a function of time. And they have to re recalculate and reset. That is usually done every, every 50 years. So 1950 was one epoch, 2000 is one epoch. And in 2050, we have to set the coordinates again. Um, but we only have to look at the differential position because it's applied to all coordinates, to those of Sirius and of Saturn. And so that makes up only for 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes. So we can forget it as well. Mm -hmm. So the only but unimportant um, uncertainty here is uh, plotting, plotting the retrograde motion. If, you, if we find uh, the reference epochs, um, for convenience, I've calculated that only for um, every half month. Um, but that is only an offset to the old problem and doesn't really matter. So in essence, um, all the uncertainties we have are very small, and especially very small to the time lapse of delta T that we gave ourselves of 1.5 months. So we talk about uncertainties which are smaller than 1.5 months, with which we try to center the 4.5 month retrograde motion. Now, um, we can think now of various cases to um, get a feeling of what, um, again, this absolute is not important because it's always positive here to get a feeling of uh, what this formula does. So let's first assume that the orbital period of Saturn is exactly 29 years. If that would be the case, then exactly after 29 years from the reference epoch, Saturn would be on top of Sirius again. And that means that the differences in coordinates would be zero for all further epochs. Now we can get a little bit nasty and we say, what about if the orbital period of Saturn is 29.5 years? Then every other orbital period, it comes to zero. And in the meantime, it has some other large value because 0.5 plus 0.5 is one. And then it becomes commensurable with one again. And then if you take smaller values here, uh, 29.125 years or 29.0625 years, uh, then the period of this reoccurrence of the um, falling on top of each other of the uh, positions, of course, of Sirius and Saturn, that, that period becomes longer and longer. So what can we expect for our true um, orbit? If we take the orbital time scale of, uh, of Saturn of 29.5.4571 years, well, that's basically 29.5 plus a little rest. So basically, we expect a strong beating um, as we had it for 0.5. So every next but one um, orbit, um, this congruence will be reached, and there will be modulation of a few hundred years from this rest will add, which will add to this as well. Now, doing the calculation, it looks like this. In fact, we see this strong beating from every other epoch to every other epoch, and we see that there are deep minima, that is when uh, Basically, Saturn and Sirius have the same right ascension. And we see a modulation. Yeah, the modulation is about uh, 330 years. 
And um, so every 330 years, uh, this will reoccur. But the interesting thing now is that this here is a series of close approximations of Sirius and Saturn in coordinates. And especially here around the year 1000, this is when exactly um, Saturn uh, comes to lie with his retrograde motion on top of Sirius. So actually, this set of minima happened exactly during the golden age um, of um, Arab uh, poetry and research development. So that, that's, that, that's very interesting. Um, and we can now do the calculation for the first BEB uh, and then for the second BEB. So you see they're very similar, always three sections where minima are reached. A little phase shifted uh, because the second BEB is tilted by 25, 30 degrees. Um, but here's now the building time of the first BEB, building time of the second BEB with the date mentioned by Abdel Zahir of 1102. Mm -hmm. And we see that within this uh, period of 300 years, um, these two dates of building the BEB fall exactly in that region where um, Saturn came to lie on top of Sirius, on top of the BEB. And that means uh, we can now pinpoint when uh, Ali bin Muhammad Anili must have been living, if he was indeed inspired by this phenomenon. But if, if you take all three minima, then, it's, then you get this time interval. And if you take the deepest minimum where the um, alignment between Sirius and Saturn over the Bibs Vela was best, uh, then you can take this uh, date around 1000, then he must have lived in this narrower uh, region, in narrow interval, under the assumption yeah, that the lifetime is about 50, uh, 50 years, so plus minus 25, and that uh, the strongest activity of his poetry uh, was approximately in the middle of his lifetime. So if these are violated, you can shift the interval a little back and forth. So now in comparison, this is now the Anili interval when he probably lived in comparison to when Abdel Zahir lived, who first quoted the poem, uh, it's one of the first to quote the poems, and to al Makrizi, who made a comment on Abdel Zahir's version of the poem. So the intermediate results that we can come up with. So simultaneous culminations or centerings of Sirius and Saturn over the BEB versions occur. There is a 330 year period. And uh, within that period, these right ascension separations between Sirius and Saturn scatter till up to 1.3 times the full width of the retrograde motion. So it's not always centered, sometimes it's off, yeah, and so far off that it's away from Sirius and away from the BEB. So it's not Pirasi, definitely. And there are these deep minima around 950 and 1005 and uh, um, 1060. And the 1005 minimum is the deepest one. And um, yeah, such a centering did not occur before or after um, uh, 300 years uh, before and after this time. And if it's this minimum here, it could also be that the first bet is meant by uh, Mohammed Anili, not the second one. And another intermediate result is that the poet um, Mohammed Anili must have lived in this time interval that we now pinpointed, and that he was most likely inspired by this event to write an appraisal um, of the Bet Azuela, and that he may, live, may have lived in this time interval. And uh, if you refer, as, as I mentioned, to the 2005. Um, um, event, um, then it could very well be this, uh, the first babe rather the second babe that he was referring to. Also, although Al-Zahir, uh, as we have seen from the text, uh, talks about the second babe. In any case, um, Anili's appraisal of Babes Vela is a very nice example, as you uh, saw now, of poetry um, dealing with architecture, you know, the Ather Fil Qahira and the history of the city of Cairo and the astronomy, including the Milky Way, Sirius and Saturn, and also Quranic tradition. And that is the analysis um, of this little poem, which, as I said, is a very small result, um, but it's very reassuring. It just tells you that the poem is not just nice words put together, but uh, that apparently uh, a rarely occurring astronomical phenomenon, namely the 
culmination um, of Sirius and Saturn on top of each other was actually mentioned here and described. And that is the end of this little contribution. And we now can make either a small break or continue as you wish. But in any case, we have to go to the next set, the next PowerPoint. And maybe we have a small break, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, if you want to, unless you want to continue. Break. Yes, break. Let's break. 10 minutes, not more.
<clears throat> okay, then we start again. And there's a few questions that were brought forward. Um, the alignment and recurrence If it is 20 years to 29 years, I mean, here's the other two. So, yes, well, um, and as I say, of course, Saturn goes through its retrograde motion every year, but um, every year, uh, but, but always uh, every year at a different location in the sky. Right? This is depending on uh, how the Earth uh, rotates with respect to the Saturn rotation. And it's only after one full rotation of Saturn, 29.5 years, um, that you hit approximately the same region. So that, that is then highlighted and marked by, um, by Sirius, by the position of Sirius. But then if you hit it right on top, that is if you get out exactly with Saturn and its center of the retrograde motion over the position of Sirius, um, that ha that happens only every 330 years, right? All the other uh, occurrences um, happen much further away. So, and the, the distance between Sirius and um, Saturn in its retrograde motion can be so large that um, the retro that the retrograde part even doesn't touch the position of Sirius. So it can be can be way off. Uh, so in that case, it is not on top; it's at the side, right? So, and if he says in his poem, uh, which is more the indication on being exactly on top, then, then he means on top. So, and that, that only occurs very rarely. But other than that, um, both Sirius and Saturn, of course, culminate. Um, and Saturn culminates all over the place, um, depending on uh, the relative position of the Earth with respect to Saturn. And then the other question is, what did you inspire to do research about this phenomenon? And how did you find such information? Um, I found such information by just looking for it. So um, I went through different sources and typed in Majara or Darpa Tebena and then see what I could find. And uh, one very good, well, many sources have been given yesterday in the, in the, in the um, contribution on mathematics, um, but um, a um, another interesting uh, source for looking at uh, uh, text is um, Al Maktaba Shemila. So in Al Maktaba Shemila, which is an Arabic um, uh, website, um, many, many, many of the historic texts have been digitized. And there's various ways to search for words and combinations of words. And so you just type in your choice and then you get a long list of um, texts and um, text passages where these words occur. And you can uh, select them, look at them, and you find information about um, the corresponding um, book. Um, and you can separately from Maktaba Shemila also look for that book then and see whether it has been properly uh, put into the website, the text. And uh, so this way you can find many, many um, interesting sources concerning whatever keyword you type in. And that is one of the ways I found this poem. And as I said, I found it and, and uh, thought about it and put it on stock, uh, but only now recently I got back to it. And I find it just amazing because it's a nice, nice piece of work. And it's so nice that you can relate it to something, something real happening on the sky, right? And as I said, it's not only poetry, like talking about colors of flowers or something, it's it, each line contains detailed information and you can just get at it and combine it. And in combination, you find an answer which matches um, your assumption, namely that something must have happened, that the author was driven to write uh, these lines about uh, Bebzuela and about the occurrence of this astronomical phenomenon. Any other questions? Say again? Ah. Yeah, well, Abashara and the retrograde motions, I'm not sure. Well, this is a coincidence that the, that the curved line looks like the retrograde motion of, of Saturn. 
No, Ad Bashara is um, a term um, from Mamluk um, uh, warfare, basically fortification. And uh, it, is, it is a very broad term, and it can also be just a hill, just to protect the soldiers uh, from uh, the, the um, armaments from other soldiers. But uh, in at, at various um, locations, um, I found the word al Bashura, and um, it has also been highlighted by Al-Makrizi um, as this curved entrance. And um, these curved entrances truly exist. I gave him an example. And uh, in any case, if, if you have the opportunity, you should go to, to Granada. Uh, the Alhambra Palace is really, really very, very nice. And there you find a very nice example for this Bajora, this curved entrance. And, uh, but if you go, um, you have to get your tickets two weeks in advance. Uh, because you, just going to Granada and thinking you can visit the Alhambra doesn't work. Right, because they're so short in tickets, you have to buy the tickets two weeks in advance. You have to keep that in, in, in mind if you do. But it's really worthwhile. It's very, very nice. And uh, yes, there's also a new masjid on the other side of the Alhambra uh, since a few years now. And that's also a very nice center. And uh, in any case, uh, it's only recommendable. Okay. Other questions? No? Then we can continue. And now we go into some of the texts. And this basically covers the three, um, three or four um, um, articles uh, that I've uh, written on this. And um, I think they're also in the material that was sent around. So you can uh, look it up and, and read the articles and also look at the references in there. So, So let's first talk about um, the name Milky Way as such. And um, interestingly, the name is always linked to what people in the region see. Yeah, so Milky Way uh, stems here from the Greeks. They called it the Galaxia Scyclios um, and uh, Via Lacerte in Latin. And Via Lacerte means Milky Way. Lac Lactis is milk. And uh, so this, this just means that the appearance um, of the galaxy is somewhat milky uh, in the sky because there's so many stars um, uh, bunched together that it has a milky appearance. Um, whereas, for instance, um, in, the, in the far north in Sweden, the Milky Way is called Wintergatan, which means winter road. Because first of all, in the north, you can't see the stars in summer uh, because the days are very, very long and you always are in twilight. So you can only see the Milky Way in winter when the days are really very long, right? And if you're way, way up in the north uh, to the polar circle, uh, one night equals one day, at least once in a year. So, and, and then you see this only, um, this, this gatan, this, uh, this street only in winter. And similarly, I mean, there are many, many names uh, for the Milky Way in uh, Arabic. Uh, Majarra uh, means, to, to, stems from to drag something along the sky. And similarly, Darpatadana, uh, means um, the, uh, the road with tibbon. So there's like like straw straight out um, along the, the sky. So rather than milk, uh, the, 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 the thing here is straw that has been straight out. So it depends on the, on the region. So the content, what we go through is uh, we have a number of authors that have written something on the Milky Way. So Ibn al -Haytham. Uh, went with the determination of the Milky Way and its distance. Ibn uh, Akhir, from this you can sort of delineate the role the Milky Way played in society or knowledge about the Milky Way. And Zu Aruma is a very, very early uh, mentioning of the Milky Way. This has something to do with the um, Al Fakhr poetry. So this is boasting in, in the great heat. And Al Mazuki and Ibn Qutayba uh, are more geographs. From this, you can delineate orientation in space and time from the information on the Milky Way. And Imagid, of course, is the great navigator um, in the Indian Ocean and the Arab Sea. And uh, he also uses the Milky Way as a tool to quickly find stars that are used for navigation. And in, in particular, in the dark regions in the very, very south. And then finally, um, the Milky Way statements that have been around and that link the Milky Way with weather conditions, with rain and so on. We'll go through that. 
that have been criticized, and there's a lot of criticism around, and Al Mazuki, uh, Al Giorgiani, and e Al Eji um, uh, wrote something on it, and Al Eji even wrote a Kalam text uh, on the Milky Way and on this particular combination, the Milky Way and, uh, and weather. And finally, the whole thing we can link to um, the so called great debate that I mentioned earlier. Um, that is um, the uh, nature of the Milky Way, which is only known since 100 years. So only, only since 100 years, we know that we are living in a galaxy, in a spiral galaxy. Before that, it was completely unknown, right? And all we had before that is uh, Imal Haitham's knowledge about the fact that the Milky Way is far away. And so there are some uh, comparisons one can draw between the time Imal Haitham came to his conclusions and uh, the researchers beginning of the last century came to some conclusions. So these are the references, and this is a nice picture of the Milky Way, as you can see it from Paranal. Uh, that's the Southern the European Southern Observatory in Chile. And uh, that's also very, very nice because there's no cities in the surroundings. And you can see all the globular clusters and the uh, large and small Magellanic cloud and the cold sac uh, in the Milky Way and all these nice structures. It's really very nice. Now, this, this we have seen, this just for orientation, and we need this later um, when we talk about Ima Dachik's um, description of the Milky Way. Uh, this is how it looks like. That's the result of observations. So we are living in a barred spiral galaxy. The bar, however, is shorter than the distance of ourselves to the center of the Milky Way. So the bar is an inner phenomenon. And there are also spiral arms, and we are living at the inner edge of a spiral arm. Right. And the, the disk, the Milky Way disk, is very narrow. Um, and um, here's a scene from the side. And at the center, we have the so-called central bulge. Um, and um, that's how it looks like. So what you see from the Milky Way from the Earth is basically um, yeah, the, 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 the disk in, in side view. That's why it's linear. Right? It being linear on the sky doesn't mean that it's, um, that it's not a disk. If you would be able to look upon it from above, you would see it as a disk. Now, this is now the timetable. So this is the lifetimes of the different authors um, that we will go through. You can see Imman Haitham and al -Mazuki. So I'll put a double arrow if birth and, um, and death dates are known. And if only uh, if the birth date is not known, then it, it's an open error. And for Ibn Rahik, we have nothing. We have only have the approximate time when he was living. That's why there's a dashed line. But we'll go through all of these, and you see that they're very nice, pad out the, the golden age um, of Arab literature mm -hmm. and research. And this, this is it, the middle, the middle period, basically, the golden period. And we can go back to the Greeks for a little while and uh, talk about this uh, galaxy as Cyclius. The Greeks already had a good um, reception of the Milky Way, Anaxagoras and Democritus. Um, has stated that the Milky Way most likely consists of many, many, many distant stars that just give the Milky appearance. But then Aristotle uh, messed it up a little bit, uh, and he proposed that it's a phenomenon of the upper atmosphere. So most likely he was influenced by uh, the streaming the, 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 that, that, um, that, the, that the Milky Way has something to do with the weather conditions in summer. So because in summer, as we'll see, uh, July monsoon starts and rain starts. But this is also when the Milky Way is positioned high in the sky and also um, almost orthogonal to the to the uh, to the to the, to the, to the uh, um, horizon. And um, so people have causally linked this, although there's no causal link. So they have said it's it's causally linked that if the Milky Way is up, it starts to rain, right? And he was probably influenced by this and therefore thought that it must be an, a phenomenon of the upper atmosphere, so clouds that are responsible for rain. But that was wrong. And there was critics uh, also by the Greeks already put forward by this. Olympiodorus, the younger, said that it is, if it is sublunar, I, that means the distance is closer than the distance to the moon, i.e. a cloud or something, then it must have a parallax. And a parallax is sort of an angle under which you can look at an object and uh, you see it then moving with respect to the background. Uh, if you look at your neighbor and look at, him, no, no, look at the neighbor 
through your left eye. With respect to the background, you see the neighbor at a different position as if you would look at, at him through the, to the right eye. So that, that's, a, that's the effect of a parallax. And that, that, is, that, that is an indication uh, for the fact that your neighbor is actually very close. Uh, if the neighbor would be very far away, the neighbor would be at the same position with respect to the background. This is also how we determine distances to nearby stars. Right? We, we look in summer and we look in winter. And then they will have moved a little bit with respect to the background. And from this, you can deduce their distance. So that's what Empleodorus uh, said. And uh, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rush didn't really contribute to this. They followed along the meteorological interpretation. But then Ibn Haytham followed basically Olympiodorus, at least mentally, with the idea. So there will be three parts in this little contribution. First, we talk about the work of Ibn Haytham, namely the distance to the Milky Way. And then second part will be uh, an Ibn Rahir's work, mainly there's traditions and history that is linked to the Milky Way. And then the last part will be more technical, that is orientation in space and time, um, how the Milky Way can actually be used as an indicator for time and as an indicator for location. And it can also, in some regions, be used as an indicator for the direction of prayer, as we will see. So part one, distance to the Milky Way. And now we concentrate on Ibn Haytham out of this crowd of um, writers. The way I got to this, uh, as explained earlier, is once um, I had the opportunity to go to Goa uh, to a conference uh, put forward by the by the DAD, by the DAD, and I thought, well, maybe if I go to Goa, maybe I should stop by in the Emirates and visit um, the astrophysicists here, because this is actually not a great deviation, and uh, I did it. And after this, and I, and I, I gave a talk, and I wanted to give a muqaddima in uh, Arabic, so a short contribution on findings uh, um, on the Milky Way from the Arabs. And um, I realized that there was a wealth of data present, and I found Ibn Haytham's um, um, not work, but our, the, the statement that he had put um, a limit on the distance to the Milky Way. And uh, so after giving this muqaddima, I thought, um, how did he do this? I mean, how, how was he able with a naked eye on making a statement on the distance to the Milky Way? And I wanted to find this out and started to search for the original manuscript. Um, and this is basically the, the, the line tracks that I had to follow. Uh, so documents were fl floating along the yellow paths and uh, traveling occurred during uh, along the red paths. And as you can see, um, I asked in Qatar, but they didn't have it. Then I first asked in Leiden, and they said they, had, they didn't have it as well. Um, and, um, but then um, I contacted Orasti um, uh, Rashid in Paris, and he, he knew about the article. And he knew also about the fact that there are three versions of it. So he had a copy of one of them. And he also knew the, uh, the Leiden um, number of the manuscript. So I talked back to Leiden and said, hey guys, you do have it, this is the number, please look it up, and can you send me the article? And they were so kind and sent me the, the article. And later I also visited Leiden to have a close look in reality at the booklet so that I could see the thing that I translated and, and actually touch it, that was very revealing. And then um, with the information from Paris, uh, I was able to contact uh, the, a library in Erdine, and they were, were very nice and very promptly sent me uh, their copy of the manuscript. That was very, very nice of them. And then I tried to get at the um, uh, version uh, that was present uh, in Iran, uh, in Tehran. And first, first I tried to contact them and nothing happened. And then uh, I have a couple of um, Persian students. I asked through the previous supervisors in Tehran of, the, of these students, they asked them to contact the library and that worked. And then the librarian uh, talked to me, and uh, she was very kind and sent me uh, their version as well. So I then had all three versions at hand and could read them and could, and could compare them. So, and then, yeah, here we go. So let's start from the beginning, um, the, the Leiden version of it. Um, that, that all starts in uh, Erlangen, the University of Erlangen in Germany. So there was this physicist, um, uh, uh, a bit more than 100 years ago, who was uh, interested in optics. 
And um, so he was studying Ibn Haytham's work concerning optics, but then he realized that there is um, also um, um, something going on with an article on the Milky Way. And this is him, Eilhard Wiedemann. Um, so he was born in Berlin and then later worked as a professor in Erlangen. And he was very famous at his time. Uh, and he was a member of the Leopoldina, which is a eclectic circle of, um, of, uh, of, of, of teachers and of uh, professors. And um, so he, he did go for it. And he wrote an article um, with, a trans with the first translation on it um, and in, in, a, in a, a, a newspaper called Sirius, uh, so like the star, right? And um, so that I could get as well. Uh, that is uh, online. And um, this is the, the article, so it's very short. So it's an introduction, then the translation, and then a little, a little um, interpretation at the end. But um, both the interpretation at the end is not really helpful um, because um, actually at the time when uh, Wiedemann translated this, uh, people didn't know uh, what the galaxy was. So that was 1905. And uh, the great debate, as we have learned earlier, happened in 1920. So, um, and then also there were some mistakes uh, in the translation um, and uh, it had not been yet translated into English. So um, Rashi Rashid uh, pushed me and uh, said, well, well, translate it, write an article on it. And so I, I went ahead and uh, translated it again uh, with the things corrected and gave uh, a full scale interpretation of it. So Leiden, uh, Leiden Library, um, as we have he heard yesterday, has a big collection of books. And uh, that was actually triggered by, um, by Bible studies. So since they were very interested in the, in the Bible, um, they, and the Bible has uh, many uh, uh, translations and many roots, uh, they were also compiling, compiling um, uh, uh, Aramaic uh, and Arabic scripts. And they came out actually with uh, one of the first... Um, 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 word book, uh, Latin, uh, Arabic. So, and uh, as I said, they have a large number of, of manuscripts, which you can actually get to. And this is the uh, copy of um, the Leiden manuscript. Uh, as you can see, very nicely written and also very well readable, actually, with all the dots in place. And um, this is the, the, whole, the full thing on two and a half pages, approximately. And that was very, very nice. And uh, as you can see, very nicely written out here, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then comes a small sentence that basically says it all. That is namely that uh, him, um, um, Ibn al-Haytham, uh, answers now a question to a interested person who wants to know whether the Milky Way is part of the atmosphere or part of the skies. Right. And so this is basically an abstract. Then the uh, Turkish version uh, from the Sel uh, Selemiya Library in Erdina uh, that was sent to me. And uh, that was, looks like this, a very nice um, uh, Turkish uh, Persian. I'm not an expert in handwriting, but handwriting. Uh, very nice, uh, a little bit more difficult to read. Uh, the, um, the, the dots were not all in place uh, or where they should be. But uh, the fact that I had the earlier version actually enabled me to read it. Um, so that was also very, very constructive. Um, here we go. It's a little bit denser written, but also nicely worked out. And this text actually, it has a few stamps and, and, and marks on it. It was donated to the library by uh, Mustafa Pasha uh, in 1806. And there's no date on the book. Um, but um, there is dates and names of uh, owners of the manuscript, right? And this is, this is helpful. And then the Persian version from Tehran, um, that's the entrance of the library. Uh, I've not been there, uh, but they have a very vast collection of Persian, Arabic, and Turkish manuscripts. And uh, even al Haytham's work on the Milky Way belongs to it. And even more denser written, only two pages, uh, but artistically very nicely um, ornamented. You can see uh, it's uh, translated as uh, an endowment, truthful, just, and religious. 
that's uh, what's written up there, sort of. And that uh, if you look at this as a reader, as an innocent reader, you know, ah, okay, this is, I mean, I can read this. What follows here in the article is probably okay, right? Um, and so that's a justification for actually going through it and reading it. And um, yeah, and here you can compare the three manuscripts and with the exception of the introductory sentences, they have been rearranged a little bit. So in the Leiden version, you have a Bismillah, then there's the first sentence and the second sentence. And in the Selimiya version, you have the first sentence, then the Bismillah, another appraisal, and then the second sentence. And in the Tehran version, you have an appraisal, the Bismillah, and then the second sentence, and then the first sentence, and another appraisal. So it contains all the same information, but mixed a little bit, so artistically arranged. But if you accept this, and also the very last uh, lines of the article, then uh, the articles agree to within 97%. That we don't know. I come to this. Yes. Yes. No, Manjara is. It comes from from Jarra, from from drifting something. So that that's a name of the Milky Way. No, 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 no. They they look at it as a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. Yeah. And how the texts? I will I will come to the how the texts are linked. Um, then. Um, the uh, the uh, Leiden version has um, well I could go to the to the book actually where the version was in um, the text itself didn't have any um, date on it but the text in front of it and and behind it uh, they had indications so the the manuscript actually um, was owned by uh, some Muhammad Ali uh, to give his signature and there is also um, uh, delineations in it. There, there's this uh, this uh, acronym, but the acronym. All the books have this acronym uh, that went into the library. So this Academia Ludgunum uh, Batavorum, and then but then there is a stamp, which is sort of this eagle that has a snake in its beak, and th that is indicative for a collection of books. Um, that uh, collection here you can see a few others that have the same stamp. So that's a collection of books that most likely came from Jakob Golius. So it, it's a, it was originally a private collection. He went several times into the Middle East and bought books and brought them back. And this is from his collection. And that collection then went into the library of Leiden. And as I said, there's other manuscripts with similar indi indications. Yeah, so, we, so you can now can say that the um, that the Imraithan text entered the Leiden library uh, early 17th century. Uh, but it's, of course, no indication for the actual um, um, date when the text was written. In any case, there's something else which is quite interesting. Um, if you look at uh, Imar Haisham, Imar Haitham's work, um, it actually includes many more articles on astronomy than on optics. So he's rather more an astronomer than an optician, uh, which is also not valued really. Um, but in any case, at some point he went to uh, Ptolemy's work, and as we had learned uh, yes, yesterday or the day before, um, there were problems with Ptolemy's work, and he expressed doubts and criticism to, to uh, Ptolemy, and, and quite harshly actually. So with uh, writing an article, the resolution of doubts concerning the Almagest, and so on. So on the other hand, in this article on the Milky Way. He is full of um, good words for, um, for Ptolemy. So he, he, uh, he, he, he appraisals him and puts him forward as an honorable man. Like if he had found the parallax of the Milky Way, he would certainly mention this in his work. And there's other positive statements on, on, um, on um, Ptolemy. So, and you would have not believed that if he had um, criticized him so much that he would then come forward with positive words. So it is very likely that since um, the uh, this resolution of doubts concerning the Almagest was completed after 1028, that um, that the work on the Milky Way was actually written 
before or at or in 1028 or just before it. So it may very well be that this very short but comprehensive article on the Milky Way by Ibn al-Haytham is one of his first works uh, in astronomy. And this is now everything we know about the texts. So there was well, all these copies that we have, these three are probably copies yeah, of copies. So there must have been an original text, which is probably lost. And there may have been other copies. And then there are these three copies uh, that uh, are delineated from, from those other texts. And most likely they are not really linked. Yeah. Um, and there, there are possibilities that some information uh, flow took place, but most likely they're independent, yet uh, they agree to a very large extent with each other. So the copying was done very thought, uh, thoroughly. And then we have Wiedemann's translation uh, with an improved translation that I put forward. So that's basically the history of text as a function of time. And now we can go to Ptolemy. He had the Almagest translated here. In, in Arabic as well. And um, here again, a statement um, on Ptolemy from Ibn al-Haytham, the proof which points out uh, the truth of this matter and which leaves no doubt is that Ptolemy explains the state of the galaxy in the book Almagest. So this is, this is no, not a criticism, this is an appraisal basically. So he gathered locations and distances to stars as you see it in the galaxy and verify the location of all stars that you see it in it uh, from its edge. That is basically indicating what Ptolemy's work says, because Ptolemy has written a great article, a large article on the Milky Way uh, in his Almagest, uh, including a detailed description of all the stellar configurations and, and also of the brightest stars and their distance to the edge of the Milky Way, whatever the edge is. Yeah. And Ibn al Haytham has taken that article and looked at these stars again and the edge of the Milky Way. And uh, from that, he could delineate that, uh, that the separations of the stars from the edge most likely had not changed. They would have changed if the, if the Milky Way would be close and would move with respect to the background, the stellar background, but it didn't happen. And from this, he could uh, extract information on the distance to the Milky Way. So what can, what can, can we say about measurements, accuracy of measurements? So there's a number of um, works out there with stellar positions. And um, basically, there's two numbers which are of interest. That is um, the size of the moon, which is about um, 30 minutes, so half a degree. And if you want to see how much that is, you can just cover it with your thumb, right? So it's on the right hand side is the moon in its real shape. You can cover it with a thumb. That's uh, actually the thumb is a little bit bigger than half a minute if you hold it away from you as far as possible. And then um, ancient star catalogs, they have positions that agree to within uh, a tenth of a degree. So that's sort of the accuracy with unmanned eyes or little little support uh, that, that you could reach, which is about a fifth or so of the um, half degree here. And that's the, the content of Ibn al work. Um, he um, tries to figure out under what circumstances the Milky Way could be nearby and what we would see then. So if the Milky Way is moving with respect to the stellar background, then you would see the stars being located at different positions with respect to the Milky Way. That is clearly not the case. Also, another case if that he discusses, if you would observe the Milky Way from two different locations that are far away, you would see the star also at different positions in the Milky Way if the Milky Way were close. It's also not what happens. And he discusses separately what happens if the Milky Way would be setting uh, and he also says then, similarly to the first moving part, um, that then the stars would move within the uh, body of the uh, Milky Way, which is also not uh, happening. And then the only thing he says that is left is, um, since the stars are not moving, and since the distances of the bright stars have not moved with respect to those measures that were given by Ptolemaeus, is that the Milky Way must be at a large distance 
further away than the moon, similar to the stars. And that would explain that you don't see a parallax. There's some interesting problem in the, in the uh, translation uh, from uh, Wiedemann in the first translation. So there's a sort of uh, distances given of the stars, the furthest distance um, of the bright stars and the closest distance, um, as quoted by, by Ptolemy. And the largest distance is sort of two and a half degrees. Um, and uh, you can see this is, this is actually here uh, mentioned. This is Visik uh, Emiri, uh, Emisi. Uh, so this is uh, Greek and means two and one half. Uh, so that is actually given. But then um, he says the one half that has been put forward by Ptolemy. So Ptolemy said there is one star at least that has only half a degree distance. Um, that is not given, he said. But then he says, uh, but the Arab only wanted to give an example. So it, it didn't, he didn't tell the truth, but he only wanted to give an example. But actually, uh, at that point, Wiedemann was wrong because uh, he just didn't read um, uh, Ptolemy's text properly uh, because there's, there's actually a mentioning, there's uh, the imimirion. Uh, imimirion means um, half part. So this is half a degree that is actually mentioned in the text. So he just overread it because uh, not all distances were, were uh, um, um, written out or were given in uh, Greek number letters. We have heard, learned something about number letters uh, yesterday. Um, so um, that he missed because this is a this is a word that he overread, and this um, semi mirion. Uh, the word semi occurs in uh, many words, right? You have a semiconductor which is only conducting uh, the current in a half way. So in German, it's actually halb lighter, which says this, halb means semi, or semi-dry. If you would drink sect or champagne, now there's dry versions of it. So semi means uh, half dry, halb talking. Uh, so with the word semi, whenever you see the word semi, it means half. So now th this is actually the star, he, Aurige, this one here, uh, which is close to the edge. And here you see the problem, and I find this very amazing. This is now taken from, from a real survey, a large-scale photograph of the Milky Way. And uh, what I've done is uh, I asked the, the, the plotting routine to plot me one um, uh, isophot. So that's one isophot here, so, so a line of the same brightness. And then I can relate the distances to the edges, yeah. and, and, they, and, and once you set one properly, then the other distance is in agreement with this. And another example, in Scorpius, uh, if you set this properly, then also the other distances are right. So in a way, um, these must have been very thorough observers with very well-adapted eyes so that they could actually make out isophotal distances of the stars to the Milky Way. So they could actually see an edge yeah, where there is uh, otherwise no edge in this diffuse uh, arrangement. But they could relate the position of the stars very well to the body of the galaxy and in a reproducible way so that they actually could put it into their articles. Well, this, this is only the, the art of, of, of nakedly observing the sky. Yeah, just seeing stars with respect to a diffuse arrangement of light. So that so there's nothing else involved here. This is just only being able to um, have a very well adapted eye and to get observational data. That's all that says. In principle, yes, but the parallax to the Milky Way, yes. Or the parallax of the Milky Way with respect to the stars. Yes. So here you have the arrangement now. So this is half a degree. That's that's the maximum parallax the, the moon can have. It has a size of half a degree. And it was very well known uh, from detailed observations of the moon, of course, um, that it may be full moon at the same in, in one region of the Arab world, for instance where it is a full occultation uh, in another region. 
So the minimum power, and that has something to do with the distance of the moon to the earth. So the full parallax is half a degree at least. And uh, this is actually the, the, the tenth of a degree, the measurement, um, the measurement uncertainty. Um, oh. I think if you put, if you press the share screen button, it will go away. Here we go. All right, now you can see that by using the capability of uh, measuring separations on the sky, angles on the sky, to an accuracy of the order of a fraction of um, the maximum parallax of the moon, or to a limit of about a tenth of a degree, that will correspond to a distance to the moon, uh, to a distance from the earth, which is, a, is, a, is about five times larger than the moon. So that means uh, just from these measurements, also by modern standard, you could um, say that actually the, 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 the non-existence of a parallax of the Milky Way measured in this way would indicate that the galaxy is further away than the moon. Okay, oh, and that, that's then the statement by Imal Haitham. So it became clear from what we have presented that, um, that the galaxy has no parallax. And if it does not have a parallax, it cannot be in the atmosphere and not at a location close to the surface of the Earth. But it, namely the galaxy, is above the sphere of the moon and at a location far away from the surface of the Earth. This is what we wanted to explain about the state of the galaxy. So very precise language. And uh, he has a small game, a small goal that he wanted to present, namely that the galaxy is not a cloud, but further away because there is this absence of a clear absence of a parallax, which would otherwise indicate that it would be much closer. So in other words, um, Imal Haitham made the first attempt, attempt at observing and measuring the Milky Way's parallax, and thus determined that because the Milky Way had no parallax, it was very remote from the Earth and did not belong to the atmosphere. So in other words, the Milky Way belongs more to the realm of stars. So that was the first set that was done here. And that's end of part one. And now we go to part two, traditions and history. And now we have done Imal Haitham and we go to Imal Achirk and uh, talk about the role of the Milky Way in the society. So the text I also discovered accidentally uh, on the internet 
um, actually, um, I looked up um, yeah, texts about uh, the Milky Way and uh, I found a translation of Ibn Rahiek's work, but uh, the translator, uh, Ms. Shin Schmiedel, had not translated the part of the galaxy. So that, had, that is what she had left out. I contacted her and she, she was so kind and sent me a first copy of that particular um, text piece. Uh, as you can see here, Dikr um, al uh, This is how it starts. And um, that is by Ibn Rahiyek. We know almost nothing uh, about Ibn Rahiyek. And the manuscript is in Berlin. Um, and he um, was living uh, in Mecca that we know from his script here. And it was at the beginning of the middle of the 11th century. And he was most likely a scholar and uh, not only an expert in Arabic and uh, religious jurisprudence, but also in astronomy. Um, because um, he compiled the book on astronomy for non-specialists. So for people that went uh, on the Hajj, most likely, uh, so that they knew about the celestial phenomena and could use them during their travel. Um, and uh, so it was especially information for pilgrims. And it contains uh, a section on the Milky Way and how this look, does look like and uh, what, it could all, what it could all mean. And uh, this is actually the text. It's only, again, two and a half pages, uh, but full of interesting information. And that's the library in Berlin where it's located. And you can actually download it um, as this manuscript number 1349 and uh, have a look at it by yourself. The entire uh, text, uh, including this one. So let's first look at the structure of the text because there is a structure to it. Um, and well, it starts with a heading and then there is a section on, trans on, on, uh, on tradition. And then there's a section uh, in which he describes how the Milky Way can be used as a test of faith. And we'll see how that can be done. And then there's an astronomical or astrophysical, if you want so, part where he actually describes um, here what the what the astronomical implementation uh, implementation is. It consists out of many stars, and in there embedded um, is a, a statement on the agri agricultural use of the Milky Way, which we we'll go also to. And then sprinkled over the text are various names, uh, Ibn Abbas, and there's a Kaiser mentioned, a Byzantinian Kaiser. And uh, Shauba Ali is mentioned. And uh, there's also um, a curse in there. And, uh, and there's various, various, um, various statements on, on, um, uh, on the Milky Way as Beb uh, As-Sama, and Beb Al Abweb, or Beb Al Abweb, or Um Anajum. So these are basically various words used for the Milky Way uh, due to various findings, but it's all sprinkled over the text. So basically, uh, what this text does, it um, combines uh, knowledge about transition and religion on the one hand, and links them to actual astronomical descriptions. And in between, there's also a piece of history that is important to be mentioned. Transitions and history. So the persons that are mentioned by Ibn Hayek's text play an important role in political and religious life. So first we look at what religious text mention, texts mention uh, the galaxy. So the Quran actually doesn't mention the Milky Way explicitly, uh, but it's it also the, the Injil doesn't talk about the Milky Way, but they both talk about splitting of the heavens. And the splitting of the heavens is an idea um, that also the Greeks already knew. So, the Milky, what the Milky Way does as a continuous band of Milky stars, it splits the sky into two halves, you know, to the left and right, east and west. And there's various um, Quranic verses where um, the splitting is actually mentioned. And in fact, there is one uh, surah, which is called al Inchikak, uh, which is on the splitting of the sky. And it starts with Ida Asameh in Shakat. And uh, unfortunately, um, statements of the Milky Way didn't pass um, Al-Bukhari's um, 
constraints on um, on bringing it into the hadiths. So it's not in the hadiths, but uh, Al-Bukhari then put all the verses which sort of looked interesting, but didn't make it into the, into the hadith in uh, Al-Adab Al-Mufrat. So they're all in there, and amongst them also some statements on the Milky Way. Here they are. So we don't have to read it in detail. Um, it basically um, links um, also again the gates uh, to heavens and rainbow appears and so on and uh, water is uh, a dominant role here and uh, these are the names that occur uh, ibn abbas ali and another time ibn abbas and ali is actually we mentioned as an expert on the milky way here and then various words that uh, link statements on the milky way to weather yeah, there's a Qaus al a rainbow, um, and uh, there's also um, Manuch, that is uh, people of uh, Noah, of, of Noah, Noah, so that, that it, it goes to the uh, floodings, to the Faidan. Um, and so there are these statements on, on weather and plenty, plentiness of water that are linked to the Milky Way here. So let's go to the people that mentioned are mentioned in the text. So these are uh, Ali, Shauba, Muawiyah, some Kaiser, and Ibn Abbas. And if you look at up what these uh, persons uh, are and how, why they are important, of course, is Ali is presented here as an expert um, on the Milky Way, so he knows something about it. And um, Shauba, he actually started collecting hadiths. Uh, right plentiful, but he didn't put up these criteria that Al-Bukhari uh, had come up with. So he's, he's not the real founder of the Hadith, but he started working on it. So uh, he's kind of an important person in that respect. Then Muawiyah, he worked as a scribe uh, for Muhammad. So he's considered to be reliable yeah, because he did important work for Muhammad. And um, then Ibn Abbas, um, he is, of course, uh, an important person, and he gave lessons and wrote comments to many things. So he's a good source of knowledge about the Milky Way. Let's talk about the Kaiser before we summarize. Let's talk about the Kaiser that has, that has been mentioned here. It's most likely uh, Heraklius, um, because he had quite some overlap um, to the people mentioned in here, and he reigned uh, long enough because the other Kaisers that were in that uh, interval uh, either died uh, pretty quickly or were only enthroned for a few months yeah? because they were, they were too young or just, it just, just didn't work. So Heraklius most likely is the Kaiser. And um, so Heraklius, um, yeah, so he ruled from, 10, from 610 to 641. And you get also coins with this uh, name on. And uh, so there was a time of exchange. Uh, Heraklius actually, um, it was named in Muslim sources that uh, Heraklius as a Byzantine Kaiser maybe could transfer to, um, to Islam. So they had uh, great thoughts about him. And, uh, but it then finally didn't happen. At least they were in, 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 in contact. Now, in any way, um, maybe um, maybe um, uh, Ali uh, or didn't know about uh, the so and and this this Kaiser actually asks them the the ulama, uh, what is the nature of the Milky Way? Can you explain to me what the Milky Way is? And uh, at least the one person that he asked probably didn't know the. Um, the answer to it, and so he turned to um, to uh, Imam Abbas for answers. So, and that may be the very likely reason for this curse. So, when he Muawiyah read Caesar's letter, he Muawiyah said, "Oh God, curse him, Caesar!" And what do you know about this matter, namely the galaxy? So, there was not a really good answer that he could give, and he was worried about the the, the question, Muawiyah. So. Um, that that then uh, gave rise to this curse. So there was an intellectual interplay between the ulama here 
and uh, the, the well-known um, political persons and, uh, and the Kaiser on the Milky Way. And mentioning these people that we went through is kind of uh, an isnet, uh, because um, all these people are sort of trustworthy and have information about the Milky Way. And at the same time, um, since we have seen that the Milky Way is sort of mentioned either indirectly uh, or directly in the uh, al Mufat from um, Al-Bukhari, um, it is a test of faith. Because you only know about the nature of the galaxy if you know um, the scripts. So if you know the transitions and the tradition and the scripts, if you are learned, uh, if you know the hadiths uh, or uh, similar works, then you know about the Milky Way. So asking about the Milky Way is sort of a test of whether the person uh, is is well um, is well um, acquainted uh, with the uh, texts. The traditional description of the galaxy. Now, so what is the galaxy? What has it been named after? So there's um, namings like Um uh, Um as or Um Anujum, because it is so plentiful uh, equipped with stars. So as you can see here, Um Um as um, Al Majara, Wa Yokal Lahe Um Anujum. So this is actually set set equal, because not large number of Najum. And then uh, the uh, Majara. So um, this is again um, indicating that this straw, the Darpa uh, Devena, has been uh, drifted over the sky and left then a path. And then there's the question about the Bebs that I mentioned. Beba Seme or Beba Labweb in this text. So they show up several, several times. What are these Bebs? And we don't know. Um, Ibn Akir says towards the south, there's an increase in the number of gates. Uh, here, uh, written clearly out. So there's more gates uh, towards the south. And it's unclear what is meant with these gates. But if you look at the galaxy as it appears in summer, when it's orthogonal on the um, horizon, and if you look at the galaxy, then you see there's many, many dark spots. These are shadows from molecular clouds. And one might be inclined to look at them as gates as babs and uh, and in, in, indeed they they increase in number towards the south because then you're starting to look into the center of the milky way that's where most of them occur so there could be a linkage to this but um, on the other hand it is you, you cannot do a final disclosure on this and there's also um mentioning um on comets uh, in the text and uh, he says, towards the south, there is an increased number of gates. And uh, on the right-hand side, I mean the south side, there are more gates since the demons are being thrown at with shooting stars, mostly from it. So there's also a linkage uh, to the occurrence um, of um, shooting stars uh, with respect to the Milky Way. And you can do an astrophysical interpretation of this as well. Um, it, it is likely that under certain circumstances from certain directions, the number of um, shooting stars is increased during the year. But a final uh, cl clarification of these questions is, of course, not possible. So, um, and also Parasoys, uh, which is the source of shooting stars, um, might be uh, in here. And whether Parasoys and, and the rules, the demons, are, have, have a linkage is, is, is a question. But then what is interesting, the astronomical description of the galaxy that can be found in this text. And, and here it is. So, uh, and so weiter. And in translation here, it is seen in the winter at the beginning of the night to the north and south and at the edges of the sky. In summer, it is seen in the middle of the sky. Then at the end of the sky of the night, you see it not in its proper place. This is weird. Yeah, if you read it like this, without having any clue uh, about the Milky Way, it sounds like garble. But it is not. It is actually one of the nicest descriptions of the Milky Way, brief descriptions, but yet 
fully correct that uh, that that you could imagine. So this is actually um, over the course of the year um, the Milky Way in the sky. So this is a picture every midnight at the center of the month, and you can see how the Milky Way moves. It moves across the sky, and you can also stop this and plot it. Here is for the center of the night for each month, the sky plotted, and you can see, first of all, that you have these two dangles here, the Milky Way centering on the sky in winter, but very faintly, then it rotates away. Then in spring, you have a very interesting epoch where the galaxy is at the horizon always, yeah? and then it moves into summer, then the central galactic center part is lifted above and it's orthogonal to the horizon. And then in autumn is a time where it, where it moves very rapidly. So it's not in its proper place. It's go, it goes all over the place. So this is basically, these four phases is basically what um, Ibn Rahiyek describes. So, and here we have to know how the Milky Way looks like, where it's bright in the middle because there's the central region. We are located here. Uh, at the edge, and now depends on where you look to, right? And if you go to the Achete, uh, to the winter first, <clears throat> then we see it in December, January, February, but very faintly, because in at this time, in the sun, is the center of the Milky Way, we look outside the galaxy. We look towards this direction. We look towards the galactic anti-center. And you can see there's these two bright regions here at the horizon, but in the middle, there's the galactic anti-center, and this is the lowest surface brightness of the Milky Way that you can get. So it's, it crosses the sky, you can see it, and this is actually the galaxy, the region of the galaxy that was interesting uh, for the Babes Vela, right, because it was in winter. So it was sort of orthogonalish on the horizon in winter. And now we can go to, uh, Area to the to spring, and in spring it is mostly at the horizon. And this is due to the fact that the um, solar system is inclined yeah, at, as it has a path around the Milky Way. And um, here's the here's the Earth yeah, with its spin vector slightly delineated. And if you do a blow up then there is this, for the Arabian Peninsula at about 21 degrees um, latitude, yeah, you see that this tangential surface uh, touches exactly at that latitude, which means that you then have a free look into all directions. So that's an amazing thing. So that in, in spring, if you climb a mountain here in this region, you, you, you can basically look within a few weeks at the entire body of the galaxy because it's always at the horizon. So a little bit lifting up here, a little bit lifting up there, but you see the entire galaxy. So that's, that's nice. So that's why he said it's at the edge. And then safe in summer, then it gets around again orthogonal to the horizon, but this time with a bright galactic center part up. So it's, it's very bright and very well visible. And the reason for this is because this time we look into this direction. And we look towards the center of the Milky Way, where it is brightest. And as you can see here, this is the central bulge, yeah, located here. Here you see also the potential of a web, so dark shadows that are sort of holes in the sky. And that's this information. And then we have uh, uh, Kharif, so autumn. And in autumn, it's, it's whirling over large angles across the sky. So it means it's not in the place where it's supposed to be. So it's neither at the horizon nor in the middle of the sky. So the description of Milky Way is very, very short, but also very precise. So although it sounded like garble, it is actually precise once you go to the simulation and actually check what the galaxy is looking like here in, in Mecca. And again, uh, if you look to the horizon, <clears throat> especially in summer, we see the galaxy rising and then tipping over. So rising, being orthogonal to the horizon and tipping over. So this is basically like the handle of a clock. 
So you can use the Milky Way as a clock and for months, right? And so if it's orthogonal to the horizon, then it's July, August. And uh, so July, August, and that means it has agricultural purposes. So observing the Milky Way, you can check when it's July, August, and then you should go and harvest your dates, yeah, your fruit, <clears throat> because then it starts to rain probably, and uh, that will damage the food. <clears throat> so stellar hypothesis. So it's it's also in there that the milk in this text that the Milky Way probably is formed out of many stars, and uh, there was a couple of um, uh, astronomers that actually had that um, notion. So, um, so later in later at later times, uh, nobody stated anymore that the Milky Way is uh, is a cloud, but rather a theory that the Milky Way is a large number of stars densely packed together um, was the forthcoming uh, statement. <coughs> and Uma Nudum is mentioned in the text because um, it's the mother of all stars. That means this is where the stars. Um, appear in their densest configuration. And uh, this we had already, perception of the Milky Way. And Ibn Rahi offers a range of traditional and scientific information. Yeah. By contrast, we find that Ibn Haytham, if, if you compare it to text, Ibn Haytham's text is very scientific, very dry. Yeah, he just states facts and draws a conclusion, namely that the Milky Way is far away. He does not refer to any theories, Beb Alab Web, or similar things. He does not refer to any um, traditional statements. So, um, but the opposite is true for Imrahik. Imrahik gives you the full range of interpretation embedded in tradition and also in historical facts. So that means. Um, Texts like uh, the one by Imran Haytham and Imran Achirik um, basically helped people to um, understand the nature of the galaxy somewhat better. And um, that, of course, um, changed then at some point um, because after um, a certain point in time, uh, scientific and philosophical approaches were strongly criticized. So it's a text, very short text, Imrahik's text on three pages only, but with a lot of information. So there's um, sources, traditions, history, and description of the galaxy and their own of galaxy in ancient times. End of part two. Now we go to part three, the orientation in space and time. So now we have worked through Imrahitham, Imrahik, now we get to Ibn Qutayba, Du Arumma, and Abu Hanifa, and al Mazuki. So help to determine the seasons. We already learned something about this, how that works. And here's a nice, uh, it, it would, uh, it's actually running. So this is uh, from the internet. And here you can see the Milky Way actually moving across the sky and facing itself orthogonal to the horizon in one night. But it does so, of course, if you look at the same time every night across the year as well. So in a way, um, it was incom incomprehensible to ordinary people uh, why the galaxy would now rise to the middle of the sky during the months of July and August and then set again. So, But it indicated for them that at the same time, the monsoon season started, like July, August, that floods on the river, on the river Nile or, or other rivers occurred. And that one had to do, then that one had to start the harvest of dates because heavy rain could spoil the fruit. So, and then I mentioned already in Ibn Rahik's text, you have the uh, description of the Milky Way. And this description of the Milky Way is actually interrupted by a country saying. And this is here from the text now. And uh, here's this nice description of the Milky Way, yeah, when it sets to the middle of the sky and so on and so forth. And then he stops. Um, and then he comes, Sati Majar Turatib Hajar. And 
this can be translated as um, if it if it reaches the middle of the sky, so it centers, if the if the galaxy centers in the sky, yeah, then uh, in Hajar, uh, the time of date ripening, date harvest comes. And harvest Hajar will have ripe ripe dates. So and this is then also translated, yeah, the same translation uh, put forward by Wiedemann. And, um, but then um, it is also in Ibn in, Rahir's um, text also explained. So I just translated this, uh, this section, yeah. Um, but he also then explains what this would mean. Namely, he says, because the galaxy is centering in the sky, then it is time for ripening of the palms in Hajar. And we can check what Hajar is. So there was an ancient kingdom yeah, centered here uh, of Hajar. So in Saudi Arabia, it's now basically uh, same thing as uh, one of the uh, uh, regions in there, Al Hajj. And um, this is how it looks today, still dominated by date uh, harvest, yeah, a lot of palm trees. And so, so this is it. So in this, in this section on the Milky Way, um, he refers to the dates ripening in this Hajat region. So it's a clear agricultural indication. So the Milky Way, its description and its position in the sky were used to um, find out when one would have to go to harvest. As we have seen, harvest starts. And flooding in Arabia, heavy rainfall, that is, of course, possible. As you all know, sometimes it rains quite heavily. So one has to actually take care of rain. And uh, then the Milky Way's guide for orientation. So orientation is important uh, because um, there are regions uh, where you easily can get lost. And um, but you can use that the, the fact that the Milky Way culminates in the sky in summer. And there is now one interesting verse from Du Aroma. Du Aroma is a very famous Bedouin uh, poet, probably at the end of a longer poetic tradition. And uh, Nefeli uh, Matsuzakis uh, has written uh, lots on Ibn, uh, Du Aroma and has translated uh, many um, sections uh, of his uh, poetry. And um, here is her book on desert travel as a form of boasting. That is, uh, boasting means uh, being uh, fakhr, so it's basically fakhr poetry, uh, saying to the other people that um, one can be very proud of, uh, of, of, our, of the deeds that one did with respect to the other tribes as well. And this is actually the, the sentence. Uh, and uh, it says, Bishwath Yashajun al Fale Fira fi Ruusihi, Ide Hawalat um anadjum ashawarika. So that can be translated as, as Wiedemann said in this way, or in a slightly different version, uh, shaggy haired comrades. Uh, crossing the center of the desert. This is here we ha have again this uh, ras, that is the overhead center of the desert. Um, when the mother of the interwined stars leans west. So this is the Milky Way. Yeah. And leaning west now means that it has been centering. It's first it centers, then it sets. So what can we learn from this? These are actually comrades. So these are um, these are comrades. So these are um, guys that hold together, that go through um, all sorts of circumstances, and which are proud of um, their existence. And they can easily cross the desert. And they don't just cross the desert at the edges of where it's safe, but they cross right through the middle of the desert. They are so, so it's only strong guys can do that. So this is clearly Fahr uh, poetry. 
So, and this is what the uh, uh, um, Aroma put forward. So basically, he here uses the Milky Way as an indication for the high summer season, when it is hottest and most dangerous to cross the desert. Geographical orientation. As you can see from this picture that we looked at earlier, that's the galaxy in the sky as a function of time, um, some things are rather stable. For instance, here in summer, the endpoints uh, with which the galaxy touches the horizon are rather stable in position. And that can actually be used in some regions. And in particular, uh, this is what Al Mazuki uh, tells us in Al Amekin Wal Azmina. Uh, so basically a geographical piece of work that in Dinawar and Al Mazuki uh, and, and uh, Al Mazuki and uh, uh, got his information from Abu Hanifa Dinawari. He is from Dinawar, yeah, and Al Mazuki I think lived there as well. So that's this city here, and this is the direction, uh, this dashed line, uh, along which the galaxy positions itself when it's highest in summer. So and as you can see. If you are in Dinawar, you see the Milky Way going all the way straight through Iraq and then to Mecca. So basically, in high summer, yeah, you could use the end point of the Milky Way as it is orthogonal to the horizon as an indicator for the approximate, for the approximate direction for prayer. And he, so he says in his, in his verse, then it culminates and one end of the Milky Way stretches into the direction of prayer of Iraq, while the other end lies in the back of the faithful praying. And so if it's in the, in the back is the other end, and in front is the direction to basically to Iraq and here to Mecca. So basically, it indicates the Qibla in this case. And this is done nowadays in different ways. Now we have covered those guys here, telling us something about the time and location. And we still now can go to um, Ibn Majid, also an interesting character, that is in the Milky Way as help for navigation. So Ibn Majid was a very famous um, navigator, and he wrote many books um, on navigation. Here all you see the Kitab al-Fawaid, the Wusul Alm al Bahar. And uh, so you can learn everything about um, uh, navigation there and how to, what properties, um, uh, characteristics uh, a navigator should have. And uh, he also talks about different regions uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the Red Sea, how they look like, how you can identify them. And he talks about a, a lot about uh, stars that can be used for navigation and also, of course, for. Um, on, on the Milky Way. So we wrote 40 books, um, and many of them contain information in, in, uh, in songs so that they could learn by heart and then potentially repeat it by the sailors while they're traveling. So um, what Ibn Majid does, actually, he points out that these stars, uh, like uh, the cross star and the star Vega, that they are of universal importance and these navigational stars and that the Milky Way is an aid in finding and identifying them. He says also very clearly that the Milky Way as such cannot be used for navigation because the stars in there are too faint. But you can relate the position of bright stars with respect to the Milky Way and therefore find them quickly. And that is, of course, tremendous help. So imagine books. Uh, help the residents of the Persian Gulf um, to navigate the coasts of India, East Africa, and other destinations. And in particular, um, it helped uh, finding your way if you went to the dark regions. And the dark regions um, are called the region around Madagascar. So the Arabs went all the way to Madagascar, um, not Qumr, and there's even this group of islands, the, the Comoran Islands, which still have that same name. And Comor uh, was uh, the, uh, the naming for Madagascar in these times. So, and then if you go so far south, then you lose many of the northern stars that are useful for navigation. 
but you still have a few, and then you need the Milky Way even more to find those. And for instance, you have um, Alpha Beta Centauri, which he also mentions as help, and you have the stars of the cross, the Southern Cross, and those can be seen clearly from the south. And here's sort of um, outlining when you start losing and, and gaining these stars. Right? So the cross stars you can see preferentially in the south, you know, whereas uh, some of the northern stars you can just barely see until this region um, in, uh, in the south. And you here have the Komar, and uh, that, that's the region where they travel to. And even further down, it was even more difficult to do proper navigation. Now, having said all this, uh, we ran across a lot of characteristics of the Milky Way um, that are mentioned in various texts. Uh, so we have this farmer saying, this Sati um, Majar Torateb Hajar. You find this not only in, in this Al Mazuki text, but in other texts as well. Uh, you have uh, the connection between monsoon rain, and you have the Bab al Web, uh, you have the demons being mentioned, shooting stars. Uh, you have mentioning of the galaxy in spring, summer, and autumn, and you have it mentioned as um, as a fracture farch in the sky, so that that indicates that it is cutting the sky into pieces. And this is the works from Ibn Rahik Al Mazuka, Abu Hanifa, and Du Aroma, Majid, Ibn Kutaiba, and Du Aroma again. And um, here is uh, what, what when this occurs. So basically, this outlines a certain tradition tradition in the description of the Milky Way. So there was broadly available knowledge on what the properties of the Milky Way were. And every time one of these authors talks about the Milky Way, he gets back to a subset of these properties and presents them. And um, now we've almost completed our journey. Now comes the um, criticism critics on the traditional description of the galaxy. And traditional description of the galaxy here is mainly the linkage between weather and the galaxy occurring in summer, uh, orthogonal to the horizon. And there's one person which is of utmost interest here, that is Al-Iji. Al-Iji, um, coming from the city of Ij, um, he has written um, a Kalam text on, on the Milky Way stating exactly this, that there's no causal relation between the Milky Way and, um, and, and the weather conditions. And uh, his life was somewhat unhappy. So he died in a prison uh, then later. And um, his uh, text then also gave rise to other comments. Al-Amidi uh, commented uh, on his text again. Um, and uh, here's the, the, the text, the, the, the Kalam text uh, with the commentary. Um, translated, and you can look this up in this work on Ibn Akhir if you want to, and it's very interesting to read. And basically, what is happening is the discussion of the nature of the Milky Way that was uh, that was carried out well into the 15th century. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned, Al-Amidi, E.G., Giorgiani, Al-Hanbali, they commented on each other and uh, criticized the theory that uh, the Milky Way um, has a section of Abweb and um, that it's raining heavily out of these Abwebs. And um, so Asherif al Georgiani then wrote a comment, wrote again a commentary on the Kalam text by Al Iji. And um, Georgiani concluded that only uh, knowledge about the Milky Way, that is, knowledge about the scripts, indicates here, proximity to Quranic knowledge and keeping, them, keeping yourself distant uh, from uncertain explanations uh, that only these are the best tests of belief. So basically it says, stay away from, from false news, right? That's what he basically says. So again, the Milky Way shows itself as being extremely important um, in having knowledge on the Milky Way for all these points here. And here are some statements by al Hanbali uh, criticizing all this. So he says, some interpreters of the doors or the, of the gates say that um, in 
heaven gates that the heaven gates open and water is running out of them. Uh, like these, I pick, depicted this here with these dark clouds and water coming out of them. Or the crowd of commentators says, this is a metaphor. It's only a picture as an analogy for the rain as it, as uh, for the rain is as many as doors. So it is difficult to understand here, but the person here says that um, this, is on, this is not causally linked. The fact that it is raining has nothing to do with the Milky Way. And, and, and the doors that might be involved here. So that, that is basically the point of criticism. Perception of the Milky Way in early times. So all of these texts um, that were also ventilated then amongst the public uh, made the galaxy look less dangerous because you might have the impression that there's some danger uh, coming out of the galaxy because there's shooting stars being thrown from it and uh, heavy rain is apparently linked to it and so on and so forth. Um, but it made it sort of, it moved the Milky Way further away uh, remotely from, from, from Earth. And so um, it's not, not a longer part of the atmosphere. So it's not directly linked, not directly linked to, to threats of flooding or so. Here I've summarized all the information that uh, could be drawn from Al, Al Mazuki's text because. Yeah, I'm almost done. Because um, um, he talks about various uh, various clouds that arise in various heights and uh, about the structure of the sky and where the Milky Way is positioned. And um, yeah, we had that already. Early great debate. Um, this I will now very, do very briefly. Um, and I will go to, uh, we, because we had it already in Arabic, I will go to... Um, the summary slide that shows it as this one. So we know that since only a hundred years that we're living in the Milky Way. Yeah. And um, so we know uh, that the other spiral galaxies are Milky Ways as well. Um, and so that's 100 years ago. And at the same time, about a thousand years ago, we have the work of um, Imal Haitham who told us that the Milky Way is actually a part of the stars. It belongs to the realm of stars. It's not a cloud. So we went through various steps, and it took us uh, yeah, almost a thousand years to go from one step to the other, uh, because here instrumentation was not available. People didn't know how far things are away, although they had identified them already. So here we have made a statement on the distance of the Milky Way, and at the same time, external galaxies have been found, but people didn't know what they were. Here now, um, we know uh, that the distances to these galaxies are vast and could identify the Milky Way as such a spiral galaxy. So, but it's interesting that uh, like this year or the year before, we had went sort of through a um, centennial and millennium concerning our knowledge on the Milky Way. And yeah, that's the last slide that depicted this a resolving power as a function of time. And as you can see, uh, Imal Haitham and companions are at the peak of the um, unarmed eye investigation of the Milky Way. And then telescopes set in and the story continues. And at that point, I would like to stop. You can go through the slides and potentially ask me questions if you want, because they're in the, in the depository, so you got them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Andrea, uh, for this wonderful lecture and that combination of two. Uh, but uh, due to our time, yeah, no we have to uh, stop here without taking any uh, comments or questions. Just one uh, uh, simple. Yes, please. This came to my mind because uh, we are in the Milky Way. And whatever picture we take, we always walk inside. Yes. But if it get the correct picture of it, then it would we have to go outside the galaxy and in fact very far to show you and then take a picture and let's see the exact shape of it. So these are all structures it seems to me. And some of it from different angles they take so many pictures and combine it. Yeah, it, of, it, of course going outside the Milky Way is not possible. Um, but you can observe it from inside, and this is being done. So there are several missions out now that measure several 10 million stars yeah, 
um, almost simultaneously and get the distances and spectral types. So we know exactly where the stars are located. So we can, we do have a picture of the distribution of stars. And also from the radio, we know exactly where the gas is located. So we see the spiral arms in gas emission. So even though we are inside the galaxy, we have an exact picture of how it would look if we were to look on top. So we know about the structure all along the disk. No, 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 no. It's all supported by observations. Then we will go for a very, very short break before we. Uh, uh, I will give seven minutes. I, I, I am communicating with. Uh, we are uh, Professor. Uh, 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 professor uh, Hamid and Naimi. He is going to join us from his office. Uh, from the campus object, and he's ready. The team is ready, but we will meet after seven minutes. Please, uh, you can bring Professor. Can they bring their coffee here? Yes, yes, yes. So you can bring your coffee to warm you up. You know. <laughs>